so uh, welcome to this video about the inverse square law of radiation intensity and then this video will go on to look at some of the other equations we can use to uh, explain what happens to things like the activity and the undecayed nuclei over time as well so let's start off with the inverse square law so what this law says is essentially the intensity of gamma radiation or any other uh, electromagnetic radiation for that matter is directly proportional to 1 over the distance squared, or you sometimes see that as inversely proportional to the distance squared. So, intensity is essentially the amount of power delivered per area. So if you have a detector with a fixed area, as you move it further and further away from your source of radiation, what you should see is the intensity you measure with that detector, or the power you measure with that detector, would decrease as you get further away. So because it's an inverse square law, what you should find is if you double the distance from the source of radiation, and the source of radiation emits the same power over units of time, then what you should find is the intensity quarters, or the power per unit area quarters there. So we can express that in a general form, like this equation here. So I with subscript D means the intensity at a distance D, I0 is the intensity at a distance of 0, and then your d squared being how far you are away there. Okay, so let's have a look at how we actually prove this law. So if you want to prove an inverse square law, what you need to do is plot a graph of the one of your variables, so in this case intensity, against 1 over distance squared. So that will should give you a directly proportional graph, so a straight line through the origin, if it is an inverse square law. There. So that's the way you actually prove that relationship. Okay, so scientists have gone out, they've found out about this relationship here, they know it's an inverse square. So the next thing to think about is, well, why is it an inverse square? What's causing that? So the way I think about this goes like this. So essentially, you have a source of radiation and it emits a fixed power. So if it's like light, for instance, it emits a certain number of photons per second. So power is constant. Now, if we did this over very long periods of time, what we find, would find out is that isn't true. So something emitting gamma rays, for instance, that actually the number of photons per second decreases over time if we do it over long distances. So this needs to be quite a short range experiment. So the other key thing is sources of radiation emit it in all directions. So we're talking in three dimensions, so essentially they're coming out in all directions, so they're spread over a sphere. Okay? So the area which they're spread over will be the area of a sphere, which is calculated by doing 4 pi r squared. That's the surface area of a sphere. So if we plug that in for our area, what we can see is that intensity is going to be equal to the power, which we know is a constant, divided by 4 pi r squared, so we can see that intensity is directly proportional to 1 over r squared, uh, where r is the radius of the sphere, which is also the distance you are from the source there. So those of you who've already studied the electromagnetic fields part of the course will have seen 4 pi r squared before in Coulomb's law of charge, and it's exactly the same reasoning, because the field lines are spread out over a, the surface of a sphere at a fixed distance, so that's why the field strength follows an inverse square law as well. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Um, so how can we actually do some measurements and actually like, detect this? So if you're doing this with ionising radiation, what you want is a Geiger counter that can detect ionising particles of any variety. So a Geiger counter will have a fixed area for detection, so something usually around like this big, roughly, uh, sometimes smaller. So that's its area for detection, and I, you can see that on here, that's modelled by this section here. So what you do is you will uh, set it up, maybe take measurements for a minute, two minutes, that sort of thing, see how many counts you get over that period of time. And then if you know the area of your detector, and you know the distance away from your source, you can work out the area which the actual particles themselves are spread over because they go in all directions. And so then if you take the number of counts you measure per second or per minute or whatever at a detector, you can then cal calculate how many there were over the whole sphere. So this is typically how you would do experiments for this. Um, 
So actual count rate is what I'd call it there, would be the total number of ionizing particles that spread over the whole sphere, and we can calculate it by knowing the number that appear on this area here. Um, a quick note here, when you're taking these measurements, a thing you need to account for, a source of systematic error, would be your background radiation, uh, which has a value around two counts per minute, approximately. But you would need to remember to factor that out of your results, because it's going to be there and not follow the inverse square law. Okay, so that is the inverse square law of gamma radiation part of it. What I'm going to now move on to look at is how the activity of a source changes over long periods of time. So not short over like, I don't know, if you're doing an experiment over an hour or like days, over sort of like years, that kind of thing. Okay, so one of the things scientists noticed was that if you had a radioactive source and left it for very long periods of time and left the detector set up, what they would notice is the count rate, or the activity, the number of decays per second, essentially, actually decreases over time. So what you get if you measure it over a long period of time, you get this graph here, where you can see the activity follows this curve here. So uh, what they essentially determined is you could express this e equation in the form of an exponential relationship with time. So you've got A subscript T, so the activity at any moment in time, A zero, the activity at time equals zero, and you've got this lambda, which represents a decay constant. And a decay constant is essentially the probability that one undecayed nuclei will become a decayed nuclei in a second. So it's essentially a way of modeling probability, and then T is just how long it's been. Okay. And what they noticed from this also is that the rate of decay, so the number of decays per second, which we also call activity, they noticed it was directly proportional to the number of undecayed nuclei. So essentially, the more undecayed nuclei uh, a certain uh, material has in it, the more decays per second that you'll get. And the constant of proportionality was the decay constant. So normally, you see this represented like this. So the activity, or the rate of decay, is often represented by this symbol here. And what they found was that was directly proportional to the number of undecayed nuclei. And this is the, called the activity. So this is the general form you'll see this equation in. So let's have a look at how that works. So uh, we'll start off with this relationship that I ended up here, and we've got this equation which they found experimentally. So if you put those two things together, what you can conclude is also that the number of undecayed nuclei will follow a relationship like this as well, and you can like, work through this yourself and prove it if you want. Um, so we've got essentially two different exponential relationships for um, decaying nuclei or decaying isotopes, those kind of things. And what they notice, because this is an exponential relationship, it has a constant half-life. That's how you prove something is exponential. So essentially, the time for the number of undecayed nuclei to halve is constant. So you can see that here, uh, the, the time is constant across here. And before, the time for the activity to halve was also constant, so it had a constant half-life as well. So we've got those two relationships there. And what we can do is use those to actually find out a way of determining a decay constant or the probability of a decay in a second. So, so starting with this equation here, we know that after one half-life, the number of undecayed nuclei will have halved. That's what we defined a half-life as, so we know that's true. So if we start with two undecayed nuclei, after a half-life, there should be one. So what we can do is we can rearrange this. So let's take the two to the other side and take the natural logarithm, because we've got an exponential in there. And we generate this expression here. We know that natural logarithm of a half is equal to minus the natural logarithm of two, because we can write half as two to the power of minus one. So we can get a way of calculating what our decay constant is based on measuring the half-life of a sample. So we can actually experimentally measure half-life, that's quite easy to measure with a detector and some time, and we can actually work out what the probability of a nuclei decaying per second is to get an idea of what kind of activity we can expect from a sample there. 
Okay, so that concludes this video looking at the inverse square law and the equations that govern activity and undecayed nuclei. Um, I hope that you found that useful. If you spotted any errors in that or there's things that are not quite clear, please do comment on it and let me know. But as always, thank you very much for watching.